pray with me? God, I'm grateful. Um, I'm grateful that we get to sit under your word this morning. I'm grateful that we get to gather here this morning. And I'm grateful that we get to hear your voice this morning. God, I pray that our hearts would be stirred up. I, I know this is a sharp message that I believe you have given me, um, first for myself, then to share with others. But I pray, Lord, um, that your word, and I trust that it is true, that it will not return void. And so God, may your word do what it has set out to do through your will, in your presence. It's in your name that we pray, Lord. Amen. I'm Pastor John. I have the privilege of serving this church as the lead pastor, so welcome. Have you ever thought about what God can do through one person pouring in to another person? I, I was reading this article this week, and um, that thought came to mind. Take Edward Kimball, for example. Kimball was a Sunday school teacher who not only prayed for the hyper boys in his class, but he also sought to win each one of them to the Lord personally. He decided he would be intentional with every single boy that the Lord had given him in this Sunday school class. Surely, uh, at times, he thought about throwing in the towel because if you have ever teach young boys, you know it can be a bit like herding cats, okay? One young man in particular didn't seem to understand what the gospel was about, so Kimball went to the shoe store where he was stocking shelves and confronted him in the stock room regarding the importance of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. This young man was named Dwight L. Moody, or as many of us know him to be, D.L. Moody. In the stockroom on that Saturday, D.L. Moody believed the gospel and received Jesus Christ as his savior, and in D.L. Moody's lifetime, he touched two continents for God, and thousands through his ministry were converted people. But the story doesn't end there. Actually, it's kind of where it begins. Under Moody, another man's heart was touched for God. His name, these are some old-time preachers, so if you're not keen to them, that's okay. Maybe one day when you're bored, you can look them up. They have some messages online. The other man who then learned from Moody and received the Lord under Moody's teaching was Wilbur Chapman. Chapman became the evangelist who preached to thousands. One day, a professional ball player had a day off and attended one of Chapman's meetings, and thus, Billy Sunday was converted. Sunday then quit his professional baseball career, and he became a part of Chapman's evangelistic team. Then Chapman accept, accepted the pastorate of a large church, and Billy Sunday then began this crusade ministry. Another young man was converted whose name was Mordecai Ham. When Ham came, Ham came to Charlotte, North Carolina, a sandy-haired, lanky young man, then in high school, vowed that he would never go to hear him preach. But Billy Frank, as he was called by his family, did eventually go. It was at that meeting where Ham announced that he knew for a fact there was a house of ill repute that was located across the school and there were several boys who would go to that house of ill repute and sneak out of lunchtime and do things they certainly shouldn't be doing. When students decided to go to interrupt one of his meetings, Mordecai Ham's meetings that is, Billy Frank decided to go see what would happen. That night, Billy Frank went, and he was actually intrigued by the gospel message that he heard. He returned another night, and he responded to the invitation to receive Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, and Billy Frank eventually became known as Billy Graham. 
you could continue to follow this trail and see where Graham and all of us started with the ministry of Jesus. Think about how far-reaching Christ's message is. Think about that. This fascinating chain of events was triggered by one Sunday school teacher who had a heart for his boys in his Sunday school class. And it's estimated that Billy Graham's lifetime audience, between his crusades, his television ministry, and his radio ministry, went out to some 2.2 billion people in his lifetime of ministry. The question that came to my mind this week, which I believe that story and article kind of provoked, is in relation to our 2 Timothy 2 text. And those questions were, who are you pouring into and who are you influencing for Christ? Who are you personally pouring into or another way to put it, and I kinda like the second way better, but I kinda stuck on the first uh, part for the sermon title, and I wish I wouldn't have, because I would like the influencing better, but that's just a little bit into my mind. Who are you influencing for Christ? Paul wrote this second letter to Timothy while he was um, imprisoned in Rome. This is most likely towards the very end of Paul's life, and if you read uh, the short letter of 2 Timothy, you can find that out because Paul is really urging Timothy to travel from Ephesus to come and spend some time with him in prison because he needs ministry too. This is one thing that's important. Pastors need ministry too. Church planters need ministry too. Paul first met Timothy in Lystra through Timothy's faithful grandmother and mother, and he was impressed with this young man, and Paul spent years of his life pouring into young Timothy, and eventually, Paul sent young Timothy to go and pastor and lead and really bring some leadership to a church that we know as Ephesus, the church of Ephesus. But before Paul ever spent an ounce of time pouring into Timothy, this is what I thought was intriguing. Timothy was first greatly influenced by two women. Their names were Lois and Eunice. Lois and Eunice, but to Timothy, that was grandma and mom. Grandma and mom were the women that God had purposefully, ordainedly, put into young Timothy's life to train him up in the word of God. And then Paul came sometime later and discipled and poured into young Timothy. And then Paul says in chapter one of verse five in 2 Timothy, I'm reminded of your sacrifice of faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. Paul says this, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. And so I ask again, friends, who are you pouring into? Let's read the text again this morning, and then we will go from there. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. I'm going to encourage you. Maybe you like to read on the phone, tablet. Um, that, that's great, that's awesome, I'm not one of those. Um, but if you are so inclined, I challenge you, start bringing, your, start bringing your word to church. I know sometimes when the words are on the screen, it can be so easy, why do that? You're making it so convenient for us. There's something about this right here and marking it up and, and so I'll challenge you gently uh, and just encourage you to bring your Bibles to church um, if you feel so inclined. Verse one in chapter two in 2 Timothy two. You then, Paul writes, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. 
No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. I want us to examine this text this morning and ask ourselves the questions are we willing to pour into others for Christ or are we willing to influence others for Jesus Christ? Are you even willing? It's the question that I will ask again this morning. I find it way too easy to be a cultural Christian in our area, if I can be real with you. I come in contact with so many people and so many of them around here, they're Christian, or at least they're professing Christians. I go and it's like, you're a Christian, he's a Christian, she's a Christian. We're all Christians. I go to the, the basketball games at Coopersville and I'm like, 75% of the stands are Christians. You know, many of them come to Coopersville Reformed Church. I'm like, it could be easy for me to think, God, why did you send me here? Right? This seems like a great place to send a faithful minister to retire. Someone who's taken 35 years of being kicked around by the world for the name of Jesus. Then as an act of God's grace, overwhelming grace, you get to send them to Coopersville, Michigan, the new Jerusalem uh, of the area to retire, then eat at Deli Belly for two decades until they practically have to roll you out of the place, and then you get to just get translated into heaven. Everyone's Christian, seems like. But here's what I think I'm growing to learn about this area that I love. And it's this. Cultural Christianity can be dangerous. Cultural Christianity can be dangerous. What do I mean by that? And I thought very clearly and carefully over these words that I'm gonna say. What do I mean by that? Simply adhering to Christian values and Christian norms without a white hot pursuit for Christ and apart from a desire for reaching the next generation in the lost world all around us leads to rotten fruit on dying trees. I will say it again, simply adhering to Christian values and norms without a white hot pursuit for Christ and apart from a desire for reaching the next generation in the lost world around us leads to rotten fruit on dying trees. Let me ask the questions again, but with necessary additions this time. Who are you pouring into and what are you pouring into them? That second question is an important addition. Back to the text. In verse one, you would be hard pressed to not wanna ask the question, are we being strengthened in the grace that is in Jesus Christ? Because Paul tells young Timothy, be strengthened, be emboldened, by the grace that is in Jesus Christ. So are we, the people, being strengthened in the grace that is found in Jesus Christ, or are we simply relying on other means so we can keep up the Christian appearance in our own little Christian culture? Coopersville, Allendale, Marne, other areas, present, Grand Rapids, Standale, God's grace is found in the free favor and love that is experienced by faith in Christ alone. In this grace that we have freely received outside of any of our works enables us to radically be strengthened and emboldened and on fire for Jesus Christ. But do we experience such grace in our lives? 
And it's that grace that empowered Paul through the Spirit of God to say these words or write these words in chapter one in verse seven of 2 Timothy when he writes, for the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power. The Greek word comes from the word that we know as dynamite, love, and self-discipline. But it can be so easy to simply trust in our upbringing or our own religious efforts or simply compare ourselves to the people in the Christian bubble that is around us and say, but we're good. We fit in. We make it to church once every four weeks. It's normal. We're good. But we can easily find ourselves to become timid timid in our worship, timid in our love, and timid in raising up followers for Christ. But yet, it can be all too easy for us to have a church. We wanna just be real, full of timid believers. Believers who are timid in their worship, timid in their love, and timid and how serious they take the raising up of followers in Jesus Christ. Paul uses three analogies to give further insight and clarity on the type of strength that he wants young Timothy to have. By the way, when I'm saying young Timothy, it's, most historians believe Timothy's probably in his 30s, so don't think 15-year-old Timothy here. He's pastoring a church in Ephesus. He, he's gone through some things in life. And so he gives these three analogies, these three word pictures. It's, it's good soldier, competitive athlete, hardworking farmer. The good soldier, he says, he suffers well and he, he seeks to please his commanding officer. He doesn't easily get entangled into civilian affairs. He's a, she's a good soldier. And he uses competitive athlete. This is an athlete who is competing to receive the victor's crown by playing within the bounds of the rules. No Tom Brady deflate gate, okay, or Bill Belichick spying with cameras, all right? This is, we're competing within the rules. We're grinding, we're seeking to be an athlete who wins the victor's crown. And then he gives this third word picture, this hard working farmer who seeks and expects to get the first fruits of his crops or her crops. Have you ever met a farmer who's not hard working? I don't know if they exist. Like, uh, a farmer who's not hardworking. I've never met a lazy farmer. It was an interesting thought this week. What is Paul saying here, though? First, let me tell you what he is certainly not saying. He is not saying that your hard work and effort causes you to receive salvation. That's not what he's saying. It would contradict everything else he has ever written in the 13 epistles. Okay, that's not what he's saying. Hustle harder and you can win in Christianity? No. But, let's parallel this with what he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, because these are hard words to look at. He says these words, and I don't have them on the screen, so listen or flip there if you're there, 1 Corinthians 15, 10. But by the grace of God, once again, that's, that's the grace of God being the strength. By the grace of God, he says, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. Something happened when his grace came on me, okay? Something happened when, 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 when the grace of God captured my heart and strengthened my soul. Something happened, it was not without effect, he says. And he says, no, I worked harder than all of them. And then I love this caveat, this is important. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. He says, look, I worked harder than all of them, but it wasn't me, it was the grace of God that was with me. What is Paul saying then? 
It seems to me that Paul is providing word pictures to Timothy that suggest that mediocrity as a good or as a soldier, mediocrity as an athlete, or mediocrity as a farmer is foolishness. You wouldn't want a mediocre soldier. You wouldn't want, you wouldn't be rooting for a mediocre athlete. It crushes me when guys don't run to first base and hustle, even though they had a ground ball to the second baseman. Hustle, right? I'm a Niners fan. I'm already on to baseball, all right? <laughs> you wouldn't want a farmer who's not hardworking. If you're gonna be a soldier, be a good one. If you're gonna compete as an athlete, get off the couch, understand the rules, start training if you wanna win. And if you're going to get into farming, you better be a hardworking farmer or else you'll get swallowed up by your fields. Now listen, here, here's the point I would declare to you. Now if you're going to serve Christ, why not serve him with every fiber of your being? What's the point of simply being a respectable Christian and just fitting in the cultural bubble? Someone who just does enough. If there's one thing that is worthy of giving your all to, give it to this cause, young Timothy. As you pour into others, do it with everything you have. Pour it into people who you can entrust to go and live it out as well and share it with others. When I gave my life to this, listen to me, my whole life changed. It changed radically, drastically. When I witnessed people giving to me portions of their time to train me up, some young boy who didn't have a father in his life or a Christian home, and men were gonna come into my life and take time out of their days and their weeks from their families to train me, I wanted to ensure them that every ounce of investment that they poured into me and every bit of time that they poured into me would be a worthy one. Because there's no greater investment into people than the investment of our time. My roommate, Phil and I, had young men stay in our small 800 foot square foot apartment with hopes of showing them a new way to live in Christ. I remember being 23 years old and fostering a boy whose mother just sent him to me with a small packed bag and a couple pairs of underwears, underwear, uh, that's not plural, underwear, and just sent him to me. And, and the only thing that caused me to say absolutely when she asked if the young man could come and stay with me and stay under my care was the fact that however long I had, I had an opportunity to pour my life into him. Friends, listen to me. Mediocrity in the Christian life is the worst type of mediocrity. It is the worst. If you're going to enlist to be a soldier, be the best soldier you can be. If you're gonna buy a pair of $300 running shoes and call yourself an athlete, be the best athlete you can be. If you're gonna be inherited a farm and you're gonna go into farming, be the best hard-working farmer you can be, and if you're going to call Jesus Christ Lord, be the best stinking Christian you can be, and let's follow his marching orders. And what is the key marching order for the people of God? Invest in others and make disciples. Invest in others and make disciples. Those are key marching orders for the people of God. Imagine with me for a second. This was inspired by someone who I listened to, I think it was in 2013, I think his name's Vadi Bachman. Imagine with me for a second that someone spent over 20 years as a cook at one of the local restaurants here in town. Now imagine with me the boss of that restaurant brings this young 
kid off the streets who doesn't know a spatula from a, a pizza cutter, and he says, okay, 20-year vet, I need you to train this young man up, let him know what it means to be a cook. C could you just imagine how asinine it would be if that 20-year veteran who was a cook at this local restaurant said, oh, I really have no idea about cooking. I'm just trying to figure this out myself. I don't think I'm capable of raising up another person. If you were the boss, you would think to yourself, what? You've been working here 20 years. I've given you 20 raises. I've given you a few promotions. And you're not able to raise up the next person in line? Now imagine how crazy it is when a person who says they've been following Christ for some 20 years, but when they're given the challenge to pour into others and make disciples, they say, oh, oh, I, that's not for me. I'm not a pastor. Oh, I'm not a pastor. That's not my thing. I'm not really capable of that. There's no other area of life that we would accept such passivity but we've grown accustomed to it in the church. Isn't that shameful? Doesn't that stir your heart up a little bit? I fear being there. You're like, well, you're the pastor, I hope so. I don't care if I was a lay person. I was a lay person before I was a pastor. I fear just coming into a Christian culture and being like, just look the part, just fit it, just fit right in but yet I can't make an impact on a person's life on a personal level or scale? Here are some scriptures that were burning in my soul with that thought in mind. Mark 1, 17. This is Jesus walking down the Sea of Galilee and he sees Peter and Andrew's brother and he comes, calls them, this is the call the disciples, says, come follow me, Jesus said, and what was the, the purpose? And I will send you out to fish for people. Your version may say to be fishermen of men. My wife, I was reading this to her last night. She says, wait, isn't fishermen of men? I said, well, the NIV. It's not just about men here. To be fish, fish for people. I like that better. Psalm 78, four through six. L listen to these three verses. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, the next generation, his power and the wonders that he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children. So the next generation... Why? So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. In 1 Corinthians 11, 1, I thought to myself, can, can we say this? Like, can we say this to people? Just think about this. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Can I say that to someone? Just follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And then Philippians 4, 9. I did a series on Philippians a few months ago. Whatever you have learned or received or heard. So he's like, look, whatever you've seen in me or you've heard from my lips, put into practice. Can we say that? Can I say that? Can you say that? Think about that. Who are you pouring into? Who are you pouring into? Parents, we are to pour into our children these truths. It is our responsibility first to raise up our children in Christ. It's not the church's responsibility. It's our responsibility. Now we pray the church affirms what is already being taught at home. But in the end, we're gonna be accountable for it as parents. 
Men and women, who are you raising up in Christ? Who are you raising up in Christ? Students who are here, middle school, high school, college age, students who have a relationship with Christ, who are you faithfully sharing your life with, with hopes to raise them up in Christ? Who? Senior adults, who are you pouring your life into for the advancement of the kingdom? Who? Believers don't retire from the mission. We just die and go to glory. It's awesome. We don't retire from the mission. If you're breathing, you still have something to offer. For those who think they're too young, I'm too young, Pastor John. I'm too young. It was my 16-year-old friend who ministered the gospel to me and it eventually sent me on a trajectory that I could have never. Young girl, 16 years old, a year younger than me, one week, she's doing beer bongs with me. The next week, I'm like, where are we gonna do beer bongs at this week? And she says, I gave my life to Jesus. I'm going to youth group. And I said, they don't do beer bongs at youth group, do they? She said, no, they don't. <laughs> and she began this ongoing dialogue, my friend Courtney with me, of the conviction that the Lord had laid on her heart and the change that happened in her life and in her soul, the transformation that took place. And it took me a little while, and eventually the Lord gripped my heart. She had her whole church praying for me. You don't have to be a gifted teacher. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be an evangelist in the sense of being on a stage and preaching like Billy Graham. You don't, you don't need any of that. You might not have those type of gifts, but in all of the gifts that we've been given, because you have some, if the Spirit of the Lord lives within you, they are gifts of the Spirit, not gifts of the John or gifts of the, uh, of the Toby or just grasping for names at this time. But if you have the Spirit of the Lord living within you, you have gifts. You simply need to have a heart that is white hot for the love of God and the love of people. Do we have that? Do we possess that? Has God given us that? If not, I would be fearful. And in certain seasons of my life, and I'll be honest, I wrote this with timidity. I was wondering why, God, why isn't things flowing like on Thursday? Usually I start studying the scriptures on Monday and then let it cook a little bit. And on Thursday, usually after seminary and stuff, on Wednesday, I'm able to really process it and put it down. I'm like, I got nothing on Thursday. I just know I'm supposed to be in 2 Timothy 2. Because this was a verse that these were verses that changed my life, and I am going to keep a Sabbath, and so I don't do any do, don't do much on Friday, and then Saturday I just wander down into the basement, and I was timid as I was writing this, because it can be easy for me as well to just blend right into the Christian culture and the Christian context that we have. It can be very easy and it can be very tempting because you could probably be a lot more popular doing that because people will probably like you a lot more as a pastor if you just kind of fit in and blend in to the Christian context. So as I was writing this, I came upstairs and I told my wife, I'm like, I'm a little nervous with this one. It, it came out quick, but... I don't know. I too wrestle with timidity, with being timid in my love and in my obedience to God and submission. But my prayer has been over the last 24 hours in particular, may God produce this within all of us and may mediocrity in Christ and mediocrity in his mission become a rotten scent to our souls and may we call it out within us. I don't know what the Lord wants to do here this morning in your life, but I know, look, some sermons I just write and I'm like, well, it's, it's biblical. I felt the Lord put it on my heart and here we go. But this one was like, uh, okay, God, 
That's where we're going? Okay. I think you need to hear it. And I think, maybe even most of all, I need to hear it as well. So let's just spend a moment. Praise team, you can come up here. And let's just submit our hearts to this. And let's just ask God what it is that he would want us to do with it. Father, it it can be so easy to be a cultural Christian, to be a Christian who just blends in and and just, we're just there. We're, We're just getting by. We're just making it. We're looking okay. We're doing okay. Our families are okay. And but the mission can be so dull and the sacrifice can be so little. God, I pray that you would stir up within our hearts a passion and a drive to not be mediocre in the way in which we present ourselves to you in in our sacrifice and in our submission in that you, by the grace of God, within us would embolden us and empower us to live radical lives in you. That we wouldn't simply do enough to just get by or to just look the part, but that we would literally live it. God, would you produce that within us? And we know the change isn't necessarily instant. It's not necessarily overnight. It comes with sanctification, with this growing in godliness. But may it start today within our hearts. And may we not allow it to leave. May we not quench the spirit. May we be radical, transformed followers with a white hot pursuit and a love for you and a love for people. I don't know what this looks like in every context, but I know it looks beautiful to you in every context here represented. And so Father, I pray that over us and over anyone here who just wants to say, I'm done. I'm ready to start. I just pray, God, that they would declare that in their heart and confess their sin to you even right now, that they would be transformed, set on a new trajectory in this new amazing life in you. Father, I I pray for my friends, all of these things in the name of your name, Jesus Christ, amen.